studied, but other demographics, depending on how and why they came into tech and what their experience was like heretofore. So, <laughs> all right. Oh, okay, I animated all this, cool, got it. Wait, does this work? No, this doesn't wanna listen. Okay, cool. So, <laughs> so have you ever stood in a conversation circle? Like every convention ever, you just see a bunch of nerds in a circle <laughs> forever um, and you go and stand in one and then you wonder why they're not telling you to fuck off, right? Um, you definitely think you're getting away with something. Or someone's giving you a professional compliment, and you're like, it's just a hobby, even though like you're literally doing it for money literally right now. <laughs> or insisted you weren't really as clever as all that. You just got lucky. Um, so these are things that people are socialized to do. Um, so what is imposter syndrome? Um, imposter syndrome is usually found in high achievers. Uh, high achievers who have always had high expectations for themselves, but perhaps not well-defined expectations, or their expectations were always um, not, it didn't exactly work out the way they thought they would, but even though they're in a parallel like situation, they, they can't see that. They can only see that they're not where they thought they were going to be. Uh, they're unable to internalize and accept their success because if you're good at stuff, you know how bad you are at the rest of it, right? <laughs> if, um, they believe that their accomplishments are luck rather than ability. Uh, this is also something that's cultural, right? This doesn't happen as much in cultures where they don't encourage people to like be modest about their accomplishments, right? If, if you're from a culture that the thing that you do is be a professional and be awesome at being a professional, then that's how you're raised to think of it. it but if you're raised to, you know, in American culture, a lot of people are raised to be like, you're supposed to like brush off compliments. You're like, oh, really? Um, others will, they, they believe that others will eventually unmask them as a fraud, right? Someone's gonna have that Scooby-Doo moment and be like, ha ha, you didn't do this. Or everyone else gets what's going on. And I think that affects most smart people, but particularly neurodiverse people. Um, but anyone that's just come to the field from a different angle than they feel everyone else has. Um, you, you think that someone's already said a thing. You think that someone's already done that thing. If you say it, it'll sound like infantile. Uh, it, and you think, and perhaps you're not processing things the same way that everyone else is. Uh, but this is all internal, right? You're not checking in with other people. <laughs> they might also be lost. Um, and you can read more about it at the APA website, the American uh, Psychological Association website. Fun facts about imposter syndrome. So there's a study from 1978 showing imposter, pheno imposter phenomenon, words are good, <laughs> are partic is particularly prevalent in high achieving women. Uh, people of all genders experience it, but there's a higher prevalence in women, all the genders. Uh, International Journal of Behavioral Science, 70% of people experience it. So if you think you are the only one who feels like you don't belong at your job, you are wrong. Statistically, you should be able to count out 10 people and seven of those people will be going through the same shit. Um, and 58% of people in tech experience imposter syndrome. Why in tech is it particularly bad? Because no, one, no two people come to a tech job in the same way, right? There's the people who learn on the streets, the proverbial internet streets, or the people who went to college and just studied that thing, or the people who you know, self-taught or they came from a different country or they, and their degrees don't parallel or they don't have degrees. They got there on their own, like their, their own uh, portfolio. Words are good. I have all of them. <laughs> um, it's, and another contributing factor is uh, company culture. So this is a few years old now. This is 2015, I think. But if you look at these companies, and you think about what the culture was like four years ago at those companies, or like what you would read in, in, the, in magazines about their work cultures, almost all the ones with negative work cultures are at the top. Like the ones with that are the management, like they were nerds, they made an amazing thing, they built this massive company, but they don't know how to run a business and they don't know how to like run people in a business. Um, or they just don't care and appoint shitty managers, or they have like weird reward systems that puts everyone in competition when they should be working together. Uh, so the 
so I, I would assume that some of this is adjusted down, but I think if you're, you've been in the industry for a while, you, you've heard enough rumors about the work conditions at like the top five or top 10 um, on this, in this survey. So Expedia, Salesforce, Amazon, Booking.com, which I don't, does that exist anymore? LinkedIn, Airbnb, Facebook, like, um, yeah. So leadership contributing factors. This is a function of leadership. If you're, if, sorry, going backwards, the ones down here, it's it's less than half, right? It's it, and the highest up here is seventy two percent. The and again, it's a structural thing. It's an infrastructural thing. It's how the company is run that really feeds into it. It's not that they're going out and finding the imposter syndrome ridden people. It's the people who apply for the job because they know they can get it. They get the job, and then the and then the company doesn't support them or doesn't confirm the validity of their hire for them. So this has to be an internal process as well as an uh, infrastructural process in the company. So poor communication and leadership, right? They didn't tell you to do something and then they yell at you for not doing it. They uh, don't completely explain what they want and then they tell you to make it the rest up or like, you know, they, they tossed you a softball of like, here, build this thing and you like build that thing as best as you understand it. And then it you know it doesn't work and things fall apart and then it's your fault that things fell apart because the leadership was not communicating correctly punitive right if they punish their workers if they i don't know i don't know what what doc pay or they you know uh, fire people easily or they demote people at the drop of a hat that tends to make people more shaken than confident and it means that they develop imposter syndrome even if they didn't have it before uh, promotes divisions, clicks, and gossip. I've been at computer consultancy things that they absolutely did this. Uh, I've had I've been at uh, computer consultancy things where they would send out emails saying who the three best workers were and who the three worst workers were, and they wouldn't tell you why you were one of the worst workers. They gave you like a broad thing, and then if you ask for specifics, they're like. Oh, we can't tell you that because that would out the client that told on you. But that thing that we're not going to tell you about, don't do that thing anymore. Right. Um, it, also, the management would invite out like a quarter of the team and they'd go on like mountain and ski retreats and stuff. And it wasn't like the higher ups that they were in. It wasn't like a leadership retreat. It was just they liked these five people on staff. So. Um, and then that also promotes gossip. Right. Because anytime people are absconding from the main group and closing in and they're building a bubble to, you know, refine their, their gossip and beliefs about um, whether or not those are fair and after ref refining. Or they're working in bad faith, right? Just certain leadership, you don't know what's going to happen because they're not great at paying on time or they're not great at fulfilling whatever on time. Or micromanaging, interfering, disrupting workflow. We've all had that manager. If you've worked anywhere pretty much for any length of time, you've definitely had that manager that like will give you an assignment, you'll build your workflow, you'll move forward with your workflow, and then they'll stop and pull you off to have you do something stupid and besides the point, and then you have to get back into your workflow and complete the entire thing because they didn't necessarily need you to do it. They just really wanted you to know that they were still there and still managing you. <laughs> Um, or interfering or, yeah, so all these things, not great. Also having unrealistic goals, timeline standards, right? If you have the sort of boss who will accept a contract and give you like, we need, you know, the next fallout to be built in three months and the, you know, the owner of your company is like more financially oriented than logic oriented, then sure, that sounds great. And then passes it on to the team is like, we've got three months to build a complete, you know, FPS and. It, it doesn't work, right? Uh, it, everything has to be considered on what the actual ability is, what the actual realistic timeline would look like, what team meetings and uh, team coordination will look like, all those things. And no oversight of middle management. Sometimes the C-levels don't pay attention to the management level. And sometimes the management levels are assholes or they are people who also have imposter syndrome and try to over-regulate how they regulate other people to deal with their own imposter syndrome or they get power mad, or um, they, uh, all the horrible things manage, middle management tends to do that like, if you were to escalate it up to the sea levels, they'd be like, why is that happening? But also the sea levels categorically don't care. Um, you, uh, and even outside of tech, I've seen this in um, Tivana, used to be like this before they sold to whatever company owns, uh, owns them now. 
um, and they just the, their regional uh, managers and their general managers were not great, but they were just hiring the ones they liked and they really didn't care what happened after that. Uh, what isn't imposter syndrome? So a lot of people, you know, <laughs> it's that thing in psychology where if you learn about a new thing, you're like, that's me. Uh, sometimes it's not. Uh, so a construct of self-monitoring, Snyder's construct of self-monitoring, the idea being you watch yourself, metacognition. You are watching yourself for, to make sure that you're meeting your own standards. Uh, this is actually a good thing, but it can feel like imposter syndrome, right? You feel like you're second guessing yourself, but really you're just telling yourself what you're doing and comparing it to what you could do better, which is what a healthy mind should be doing. Um, being an actual imposter, uh, it rarely happens. I mean, I guess it can happen in tech, but you know, someone lies their way into a thing. Uh, that's not imposter syndrome. That's just being an imposter. Dunning-Kruger effect, that's our favorite. Dunning-Kruger effect is how good you think you are versus how good you are. Imposter syndrome, you're actually good, you just don't think you're that good. Dunning-Kruger, you think you're fucking awesome, but you fuck up every assignment you've got. <laughs> <coughs> um, and we all know that guy. And that is also very prevalent in tech, right? It's very rare that in social work, I see someone with Dunning-Kruger. Uh, but in tech, I've met, just casually, I've met that many. Um, it's, and the hard thing is people with Dunning-Kruger tend to be the kind that tell other people what to do, but they already suck at what, they're, what they do, and they're telling other people to do the sucky thing. So it's, and it's very hard for someone with imposter syndrome who thinks that they don't belong to be told by someone who's been there longer what to do, and they're like, I have someone telling me what to do. Awesome, I'm not an imposter. But but it's, they're taking the wrong advice. Uh, so why is imposter syndrome? There's pressure to achieve, achieve either external or internal. External is your parents, your work, your family, friends, whatever. Whatever they expect to see from you. Internal is how good you expect yourself to be. And this internal is a lot harder for people sometimes to do, like give themselves that pressure to achieve. Uh, but Sometimes they put pressure on themselves to achieve stuff that's not, rem not either not remotely possible or not possible in the timeline they're giving themselves to achieve it. So then they just figure they failed at the thing and that they are a failure. Uh, you have three basic social drives to be liked, to be respected, and to be helpful. Um, so people tend to... Um, People want to be liked, right? You want to placate other people. You end up doing what people like instead of what's correct or whatever, and that can screw you over. Or people really like you, but then you feel like you've let everybody who likes you down when you mess up. Or you want to be helpful, but you keep, you know, you, you've, you trip up somewhere and you're not giving yourself the space to figure out why you're tripping up. Um, uncommunicative families. So families that do not communicate or that their version of communication is you are going to do this. <laughs> see you in 20 years, does, uh, doesn't help imposter syndrome. If, you're, you know, if your parents, even if your parents talk to you a lot, they might not be super communicative about their expectations and you're just supposed to kind of glean what you've always thought they wanted you to do. And then, it, and then when you get into the work field, you're looking for something, but you don't know how to communicate it because you haven't been built like that yet. So that's, you know, communication skills are good. High drive to seek external validation. Uh, people who really need other people to tell them you're doing a good job in order for them to know that they're doing a good job uh, con obviously contributes to imposter syndrome. But the problem is then you start to be like, no one's telling me I'm good doing this thing right now. They told me five minutes ago, but it's a new five minutes. Maybe I'm failing now. And that, that high drive is what can tank people's uh, self-esteem. And then the false self, um, People might think that they're liked because of how they present, right? We all have our work persona. We all have our friends persona, our family persona. Uh, we might think our work persona is not our real self and therefore they wouldn't really like us if they saw who we really were. If I drop my guard, everyone's gonna peace out because they'll realize what an imposter I am. A view of intelligence as a fixed entity rather than as a malleable quality. Um, so that's, yeah, so if you think intelligence is something that you either have or you don't, or you're either in the genius ranks or you're not, 
you're not really understanding what intelligence is, um, first of all. And second of all, it's, it's not productive for yourself. Intelligence can be grown, it can be fostered, but there's also multiple types of intelligence. Uh, Gardner listed seven types of intelligence, including musical intelligence, mathematical intelligence, uh, body intelligence, social intelligence, and then three more. Uh, uh, and language intelligence, linguistic intelligence, and then like, I don't remember the other two. Um, and every, most people are really smart in at least one of those intelligences, but someone who's really socially intelligent or emotionally intelligent might not come off as that intelligent to someone who thinks intelligence has to do with how many numbers you can type into your computer how fast. Um, and that one is actually a cultural thing, right? That's also an American thing, right? You go to college. Scholastic achievement is the same thing as being smart, is the same thing as being worth something, is the same thing as being worth a job. As opposed to, you know, or you could just do the things that you're good at and that'll, you know, amalgamate into something better. In studies on gender, social, there are social and direct messages about demographic appropriate subjects, right? So even if you raise your kid in the most non-gendered household in the whole world, the second you take them outside, they're going to start seeing, and I mean, and I mean as soon as, like by the time they're three, kids have these stereotypes in their heads already. Um, girls will start to, at, but around, also around three years old, my stepkid went from climbing the rock wall every day to going, girls don't climb rocks. And it was just, had come to that conclusion in like the past week at preschool, just because the girls didn't at their preschool. Um, and, for and for women particularly, a lot of those mes messages tend to be about what you can and can can't do when you grow up. That's getting better. The current generation of like toys, the way Amazon markets toys, targets start stops, you know, like start paring down the pink aisle. Um, it's okay for girls to buy Legos that aren't pink again. So we're moving forward. Um, but the Lego thing. Legos used to be considered unisex, right? In the 70s when they were invented, there were girls and boys on the cover of the things. At some point it just became male and there's preschool studies that show like, again, three years old and older, if you put them into a playroom and have like different stations, the girls will say that they can't go to the Lego station and they will go to the playhouse area or whatever, even if they're not into it because they wanna be socially accepted and they have been told they identify as a girl and that a girl means this. So, and if you extend that to literally every other demographic, like there's messaging, there's toxic messaging for any given demographic. If you're too young, you're too old, you're too gay, you're too trans, you're too whatever. Like there's messaging about what you can and can't do from the moment you're, you step outside as a child. Um, and direct messages are stuff like from your parents. So like, I've definitely like, when I was a kid, I was like, 17, um, like our, we had those horrible KVM switches on the side for, to change between TV and Nintendo. And I went to change it and it didn't work. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna go unplug it and fix it. And my mom told me I could not. She was like, no, you have to wait till your dad gets home. I'm like, literally it's, it's doing this and then doing that. And she was like, no, you have to wait till your father gets home, right? So there's direct messaging too about what you can and can't do depending on how you're raised. But by the age of three, children have internalized that girls shouldn't play with Lego, that boys shouldn't play house. And that's even more toxic, right? We are, we, we are seeing in this generation, like millennials and, and more recent, that boys are maltreating themselves. They're getting sicker than they need to be because their message that boys do X, Y, and Z, and they don't do anything domestic. They don't share their feelings with their family or their friends. They don't do all that stuff. And it's killing them <laughs> and uh, it's, yeah. Neurodiversity, so that's the other one. If you are, if you are on the autism spectrum, if you have ADHD or any other PDD, per, uh, pervasive developmental disorders, which are mental disorders that slightly set off how you aggregate and process and analyze information, um, that's the hardest one because um, pro unless your parents were really on it and had you diagnosed and treated and, or just knew how to deal with your mindset, it is very likely that your parents, teachers, uh, classmates, everyone wrote you about how you thought. And it probably took you until you were at least in college to figure out that the way you thought is super useful for 
engineering, uh, it's just not what people were expecting to see socially. And so the imposter syndrome you've built from being rejected socially is now transferring over to how you feel, even though you've totally got your engineering shit on lock. Uh, gender studies results. So, <laughs> right, so this, everyone's seen that KCD strip. Uh, if it's a dude who's messing up, wow, you suck at math. If it's a girl who's messing up, wow, girls as an entirety suck at math. Uh, there's emotional conflicts uh, for whether it's worth it to keep going sometimes. It's, you know, it, it, it creates, I should be doing this. I'm clearly not meant to be here because imposter syndrome. So um, there's cognitive conflicts. Math, again, uh, so until junior high, until about algebra two trigonometry time, girls almost like across the board do better at math than boys. They're just, they're more willing to sit there, be quiet, focus, all that stuff. Once it starts hitting a certain level, girls are a lot more likely to just be like, oh, girls aren't good at math. That Barbie, the talking Barbie, super didn't help our cause. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know if you remember in the 90s, they put out a Barbie that if you push the button, she's like, girls are, uh, math is hard. <laughs> yeah, let's go to the mall and look at boys. Uh, uh, um, so that but that math level is where it falls down right you need coders you need people who can build algorithms you need all that shit and they're dropping like flies after a certain point of math uh just because they're not supposed to they're not supposed to enjoy math they're not supposed to be good at it if it's worse in college depending on which college you go to ucla they have all the engineering and math and hard sciences in south campus so a lot of girls end up not who do, really don't like north campus don't like art soft social sciences history all those things but they'll move to a North Campus like degree just because they're not getting as much shit from the nascent tech bros and the, you know, um, or from their professors. I mean, everyone's read the Caltech like blogs and stuff from women who've had complained about their mentors and had to drop out of their PhD programs because their mentor was like, well, I'd like to help you, but it turns out you're female <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> like, um, or they're sexually harassing the girl, the, the women, instead of like supporting them. And like um, Caltech's starting to get better at it only because they've had a shit ton of bad press in the last two years. But yeah, um, self-image. If you don't like yourself, you won't think other people like you either. <laughs> that is the hardest thing to get through, especially if you've been raised in a family that's uncommunicative or unsupportive. If you've been through school where they've always told you nothing. It is very hard to like yourself enough to believe you deserve to be where you are. Um, and self-worth, same thing. If you don't value yourself, you won't think other people value you. <clears throat> so, uh, Introverts also have a hard time with imposter syndrome, possibly because they see everyone around them talking and chatting and it's easy for them. And they think that that's what makes a good team member but they can't get themselves to get into it, right? And there's a lot of introverts in this community, so it's hilarious and bizarre at the same time. Um, trade anxiety, you are angry, you are, you can have anxiety about, okay, my mind works, but I'm slightly dyslexic, or I have this mole right here, so clearly I'm not good at science, or, <laughs> you know, like, uh, and then neurodiversity again, that one's huge, just because so many engineers come from, you know, have, are somewhere on the autistic spectrum or they have ADHD and they've learned to order their lives in a certain way and think like engineers. But again, it doesn't help their self-worth if they've been told that they're doing everything wrong ever <laughs> their entire lives up until their job. Learning disorders, diagnosis, no, right? Dyslexia, reading, math, any of those disorders, even if you've worked through them, even if you've conquered it, even if you got straight A's in your shit, you know you have that learning disability and therefore anytime you feel like you don't understand something, you're basing it on, well, I have a learning disorder. What, I don't know, <laughs> they would, yeah. Uh, racial minorities. Silicon Valley is really white. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to feel like you fit in in a place where they're pretty clear that you don't. Um, or they're, you know, not that everyone's gonna have all the microaggressions towards you, but you might, or you've experienced enough racism that it sucks and you don't want to be exposed to that anymore. Or, or you just don't think your education is good enough because, you know, if you weren't, if you weren't in the racial majority, maybe you didn't get as much chance in your 
school and, you know, uh, at, at, you know, your teachers didn't give you as much of a chance and they always told you you couldn't and you still learned the thing, but, and you passed the whiteboard test, but you're, you know, that, that, that gets internalized. That's all, you know, I'm not saying that these are conscientious thoughts. I'm saying that these are processes that our brains go through. How you relate to these issues is going to be different for everyone, depending on your self-talk. And LGBTQ, I, I would like to think that in Southern California, it's a bit better um, in terms of the queer community and not having imposter syndrome. I feel like, you know, right now we're raising our kids to be okay with whatever they are, however they see themselves. Um, but for our, again, for our generation and older, if you've had to be ashamed, if you've ever been shamed for it, if you've ever been told that that's not a thing, if you've ever, you know, you might not be as willing to share about your life, or if you live in a state where like you can be fired for being gay, uh, you can't talk about your home life. You can't connect to people. You feel like you can't connect to people on a human level and therefore you don't belong. You're never going to fit in and you're an imposter there. And it's two different feelings. Uh, you know, the profession, again, the professional and emotional are different, but the emotional informs the professional uh, self self talk. And young or elderly, right? Kids 15, but he knows the shit. Cool. But also he's 15. And he's like, wow, I don't know any of the other words these people are using or uh, or elderly. We tend to as a as an American thing, we tend to discount age. Right. Uh, once they get past some magic predefined number that we've all decided we are like well they must have dementia so or whatever it's yeah uh in the tech industry specifically uh everybody's on a team right you have your ranger everyone has their own thing that they contribute you have your warriors your you know wizards your source everyone's got something different to offer traditional measures of comparison don't really work again not everyone has a degree not every, or maybe someone has a doctorate and someone that just got their bachelor's in the thing, but they're really good at their stuff or or they just never went to school. They dropped out when they were like eight and, you know, have just brought themselves up or they were homeschooled or um, everyone came to it a different way. So it's really hard to compare yourself if you assume everyone's got or, you know, and, and also it's that self-talk thing of if you know, like in that in your team, four people got have master's degrees and there might be like three or four other people who don't but all you might be seeing is those four people with master's degrees and then be like how could i possibly be here without one even though there's you have other people on your team who have similar educational backgrounds to you and they're equally valid uh there's more uncertainty about what what value that holds in context right depending on what kind of engineering you do so like my father's an audio engineer. He hates it when he gets interns that have been schooled at a conservatory because they have learned all the math behind it, but they've no, they've they haven't really worked in a studio and haven't seen like the messy and the art to how you set up microphones and all that stuff. And he doesn't want to retrain. He'd rather retrain from scratch than try and train against someone else's training. So valuation is you know, uh, leadership, teamwork, culture matter. Again, we already talked about leadership, but your team and work culture, if, you're, if, if the work culture is not healthy, uh, if the, your team is not healthy for you, then that is something that will feed into imposter syndrome. These are all things that we need to be aware of so we can check ourselves. It's not me that's having the problem. It's these elements around me that are making me feel like I have a problem. And that's a huge delineation that people need, people should make if they're going to move past their imposter syndrome. Excuse me. Sexual demographic messaging is more complex than in most industries, right? We need women in STEM or in STEAM, but also you girls and you can't do science or math. Um, or, you know, we can't hire you because you might get pregnant or whatever. Um, the, the demographic messaging gets really messed up just because a lot of companies know what they're supposed to be doing in terms of diversity, but they've also, you know, uh, what is it, Rockstar Games that had the whole thing about how they hire and don't hire women. And they just assume, like, even if they only like to hire League of Legends, like, huh? Riot Games, sorry, yes, sorry. Thank you, Riot Games. Yeah, they, they have that thing of, they only want people who play League of Legends intensively, but even what, when gr women have gone into interview and they're like, I love League of Legends, I play like, you know, I have like four guilds and blah, And they'd be like, yeah, but you're not really like a League of Legends person, are you? <laughs> and yeah, look up the, the Riot Games articles that came out last year, I think, and they were hilarious and someone else's problem. I have a friend who's in HR at Riot and he was like, 
after the articles came out, he was like, okay, I know what they're saying and I agree and I'm trying to fix it. So that's why I'm not quitting. But yeah, it's a thing. So anyway, uh, there's a push for girls. Yeah, so the push for girls in STEAM versus the difficulty of actually landing interviews and jobs. That's the other thing. Girl, a lot of females don't actually get invited to do their interviews, much less make it to the whiteboard test, right? Uh, a lot of hiring dudes, especially if they're old guard, will be like, Nah. <laughs> and just to it's easier to toss something with a girl's name on it aside or with an ethnic name on it aside or however it pronounces than to actually ha so but we have in for f in terms of gendered messaging we have this conflict of we're all girls need to be more represented in engineering so we're gonna like make all these classes and schools and do steam oriented things and then they're like but just kidding you can't actually use that professionally that'd be silly <laughs> it's it's hard right um, younger nerds don't feel like older, feel like older nerds know something that they don't know about the industry, right? Uh, people who are newer to the industry come in and they think everyone has these in-jokes that they're missing and maybe they do, but honestly, most nerds, if you ask them to clarify, they will clarify <laughs> and bring you in. But that takes you getting over your imposter syndrome long enough to ask follow-up questions. Uh, consequences, the personal consequences are... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it causes stress, anxiety, depression, and so forth, right? You feel like you're failing at this career, this thing you've sweated and bled for. It, it can cause, it can trip, trigger problems, uh, emotional problems. It keeps people from asking the real questions to improve. And it keeps people from feeling, it keeps people feeling isolated from their peers. Communication is the biggest thing here, I think. For me, I think that the biggest weapon we have against imposter syndrome is talking to people on your team about your insecurities and creating a culture where people validate each other without having to be asked uh, because that makes people feel like they're noticed and actually working for their team instead of just doing work on the side while their team is also doing work over here. Uh, the consequences that are professional, it, it creates rifts between people suffering similar issues, right? Everyone who has imposter syndrome starts going for each other's throats because they want to show that they belong there the hardest. Um, and it, or it can cause fights because someone's imposter syndrome affects them like this and makes them mess up on this. And the other person's imposter syndrome affects them like this and makes them mess up on this. And then they start blaming each other and not really understanding that they're both making these mistakes from the same place. Like, um, it keeps people from stepping up or making suggestions in a meaningful way, right? You don't feel like you have the right to make a suggestion or you think that your suggestion, if it was a good suggestion, everyone else would have already said it. So, you know, you shouldn't say it because no one said it, so. Uh, inhibits teamwork, project communication, so forth, right? You're feeling X about yourself, about your ability to do the thing, and if you're not talking, then it can, then you might start like making mistakes and trying to hide them, or you might start doing your work in a way that's like separated from what they can see, and so when you submit it, like they're like, well, okay, but that's not what the rest of us are doing, or. Uh, second guess your instincts cause issue and error, right? Uh, you know you're, you know what you're supposed to be doing. You know the right answer, but then you're like, if that was the right answer, someone else would have done it already or whatever your, your, your self-talk is. So you second guess yourself and your first guess was right. You knew your stuff, but you did the other thing instead. Uh, so you are good enough. You are good enough. If you've got a job in tech, it's because you passed probably a lot of interviews. You did your whiteboard test. You know your shit. You, you have to believe that you deserve to be there just because you've earned your way there, however you got there. Own your shit. That's the big thing. And all engineers need that. All engineers need to be confident in their stuff, in their, in their toolkit, in their knowledge base, in their ability to complete things. Your toolkit is unique and it is needed. There is a reason you got hired. You are filling a need in that team. You, are, you might be the bard, but damn it, you're the best bard <laughs> they could have hired. Uh, ask questions, right? Again, communication, but asking questions is a huge part of communication. And that, needs to, that takes a lot of getting over your own. When I say ego, I don't mean you're like, I'm amazing. I mean like getting over your, your sense of self that is not, you know, that is an imposter or whatever. You need to get over that so that you can break through and ask those questions. That first time you ask a good question, you... I mean, they always told you, they, they always told you, right, in school, like, if you, you never know the answer to the question you don't ask. It's true, though. You have to ask questions, even if they're obnoxious questions. And 
That question might be something that seven of the 10 people on your team were also wondering about, but also didn't want to ask because imposter syndrome. Uh, better communicators make better headway. I'd be, you may notice that the leaders of various communities tend to be people who are better at talking. Not managers, because you know that can be nepotism or whatever, but like not necessarily managers, but people who tend to build their own communities, the leaders of um, the founders of hackerspaces, the founders of like the healthier worlds that we walk in, uh, it's because they're good at communication in a way that they rarely think about even, or they've learned to do it because they had these problems before. How to help your how to help yourself? First of all, you cut you yeah you can even if you think you can't. Write down your strengths and achievements, right? Have, have your own little list of self-talk. Uh, and that list can be other things too, like, I, like a mental health wall where you put like all of your, the things that people have ever written to you that's nice, or you print out all of the, the employee of the month from, you know, whatever, and just have it over your computer wall. And then you can be like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> um, Find a mentor, find someone either in your company or outside of your community, sorry, uh, that's, uh, that can help you with the things. Voice your concerns to a therapist or friends regularly. Communication is huge. If you don't feel like you can talk to your friends because they're also professional friends, then talk. Then therapy is great. It's amazing. You need to find the right therapist for you. Don't go to one that makes you feel uncomfortable, but uh, talking to a therapist can really help you take the things that are in your head and put them over here so you can see them and like fix them and then put them back. Uh, and then make a point to ask follow-up questions. We talked about that a lot. Ask friends for validation. Uh, ask friends, hey, is this cool? Am I, did, did I do a good job on this? Was this, you know, was this what you were thinking of when you asked me to do whatever? Ask them for validation. It's okay to ask, and people should be okay with telling you. And insert yourself into conversations. You see that conversation circle, you go like, hey guys, what's up? And you stand there too until you have something to contribute to the conversation. Uh, make yourself know you belong there and force other people to recognize that you belong there. Most importantly, believe yourself, believe your employers, your coworkers, and your friends. When people tell you, are, tell you you are good, you have to believe them or this doesn't work. <laughs> okay, you have to, I keep these friends for a reason. I trust my family for a reason. So when they tell me I am good at things, I will believe that. I respect this coworker because they do this. So when they tell me I'm doing awesome, I will believe them because I respect their work. Respect your, your choices in who you surround yourself with enough to believe the people around you when they tell you that you're doing good, that you do belong there. And believe a proportion of your cohort are feeling something similar, right? Again, there's strength in knowing that everyone else might be lost too. So how to help others. Speak openly about your own insecurities. I feel really this. That'll help them know that other people feel that. Um, encourage others to talk over their emotional concerns. Hey, man, you seem like you're really upset. If you need to, you know, if you want to go talk, we can, you know, you want to, how can I support you? Um, share strategies. Oh, I did this to, you know, to overcome my stuff. You should do this. Or I, you know, program this this way. You should try that. Okay. Uh, reach back. Once you're done, if you get to the top of your field, you own your shit, you know you are the best at your shit, or however good, you know, you're confident in your stuff, become a mentor. Offer to take new people under your wing. Help them understand the process. Help them get into the, you know, dip their toes in the pool and all that. Answer questions. People ask you a question, the worst thing you can do is be like, that's not my job. It is all of our jobs as a tech community to help educate all of our cohorts so everybody is the best tech people that they can be. And validate freely. Give people compliments because they earned the compliments. Don't, uh, uh, no, tell, dude, that was awesome. Right, tap it. Like fist bumps, great for, for uh, helping people and raise your children to understand the difference between fluid intelligence or understand fluid intelligence and multiple intelligences. Raise your kids with the understanding that you might not, you know, everyone's good at this and you're really good at these at these levels. You know, you're, these are all things you have benefit. What, what do you want to work on? What do you want to refine? What do you want to cultivate? Uh, so in conclusion, it's normal to have imposter syndrome, especially in tech, own your shit, support others in their shit ownage and create the work culture you want to see in the world. So, thank you.